So board choice has been a sticking point for many ITX and upgrading to Ryzen 7000, maybe even an aggravating factor. But I think this board might just be the golden ticket for most of you. Welcome to Machines and More. We're going to take a look at this MSIB 650 ITX motherboard today. We looked at the ASUS X670E ITX motherboard recently, and that board is at the top of the pecking order. It's harder to recommend that one at the price uh, with some of its quirks, and I know that this price point, and more on this towards the end, uh, the price point for the MSIB 650 ITX board, it may be more attractive depending on the price. Okay, so first off, where is this chipset position? Well, for Zen 4 or Ryzen 7000, there's quite a few chipset options. From top to bottom, you've got X670E or Extreme, X670, B650E, and the one featured on this board is B650. There's quite a few details, but suffice to say, the main difference is going to be whether or not the board supports PCIe 5.0 for the graphics card slot, as well as the PCIe bandwidth. And you'll see that with B650, you don't get PCIe 5 for the expansion slot, and you may get it for the M.2. With this board, you don't get PCIe 5 for anything. And uh, there are fewer USB ports compared to, say, the higher tier uh, ASUS X670 EITX board. Despite the chipset positioning, though, this board isn't close to being entry level. In fact, I think it's very much mid range, and the features on this board are very similar to the B550 MSI ITX board that was also reviewed here on this channel. I think that one's also decidedly mid range. MSI designates this board as part of their gaming oriented MPG line, which sits just below the highest end enthusiast MEG boards and above the more budget-friendly MAG boards. Uh, not that you have a choice for Ryzen 7000 because this is the only Zen 4 ITX board that MSI is making currently. So for reference, on the Intel side, both the Z790i and B760i are also designated as MPG products. Let's take a look here. The board has an integrated rear I.O. shield. It's very nice. And on the back, you have two 5 gigabits per second USB-A ports three 10 gigabits per second USB-A ports, and one single Type-C 20 gigabits per second port. It's not too plentiful, but for many users, that's one mouse. Uh, you've got one keyboard and perhaps an audio solution, and then you still have a few more for other uses as well. If you're looking for a USB 4, no, not uh, gonna find it on this board. However, just to put it into context, the Type-C port on this one maxes out at 2,500 megabytes per second. And that is still more than fast enough for most external SSDs on the market if that's the primary high-speed thing you're looking to connect. 2.5 GE, uh, Wi-Fi 6E, no Toslink, but yeah, actual audio connectors on the board, which uh, surprisingly is what the X670 ESUS uh, ITX board lacked. And this board here is using the Realtek ALC4080 codec, and that does support 7.1 channel audio. And yes, you do have a clear CMOS button and also a flash BIOS button directly on the back of the board, which is a great feature here. Although the clear CMOS button is a little too tall for my liking, and you just have to be careful when handling the system so you don't accidentally clear your BIOS settings. Probably would have been nice for this to be recessed, but it's not the end of the world. On the surface of the board, you get three four pin fan connectors. They're designated as CPU pump and system, but for example, you don't necessarily have to connect an AIO pump to the pump header. You can use that for additional case fans if you want or need. Two DDR5 slots up to 64 gigs total. Zen 4 is DDR5 only, so no surprise there. And there's only one RGB header. That's a three pin ARGB header. Uh, so if you have 4-pin RGB accessories, it's time to upgrade. This uh, RGB header is also in a very, very strange and very tight place. Uh, one Type-C front panel port, one 5 gigabits per second USB, and one 2.0 port that can be split out as well. The VRM design is an 8 plus 2 plus 1, 80 amp power stages. There's not going to be as much overhead for heavy manual overclocking, uh, but this is totally sufficient for running any Zen 4 CPU on PBO and even heavier overclocking on your 7600X, 7700X. It does have a set of debug LEDs at the top, which is very helpful for Ryzen 7000, especially with those longer post times. You want to keep an eye out for it, make sure everything is going according to plan. And that's something that's missing from a lot of mini ITX boards these days. Below the CPU socket is an M.2 heatsink that's equipped with a chipset fan. 
It's not as tall or obnoxious as many Mini ITX boards have these days. And one of the reasons is that MSI chose to place the other M.2 slot at the back of the board still. And I think that's a very sensible option because the lower heatsink here, it does help a lot for cooler compatibility, especially with those lower profile top-down coolers. And if you look at the way the rear IO heatsink is sculpted away, it's also very sensible and makes the board pretty cooler friendly. At the bottom, you have the Gen 4 expansion slot. This is a 10 layer PCB. It doesn't feel cheap. It feels pretty substantial. No backplate on the back of the board, which is okay. Um, and just that one single M.2 slot on the back. And both M.2s on this board are PCIe Gen 4 compatible. To test this board, I mainly ran with the 7600X since that's gonna be the mid-range go-to. I did also test with the 7700X for a brief while as well. This board had no issues with either of these CPUs and it ran the 7600X particularly well with a curve optimizer of negative uh, 25. The 7600X clocked in at 5.4 on all cores for multi-core render and that was consistent. Good silicon helps, but just for reference, those kinds of stats uh, resulted in a Cinebench R23 score of around 15,550, which is uh, pretty good for the 7600X. Uh, for gaming, I was seeing consistent 5.5 GHz single core boosts, and the board absolutely got what you could get out of the 7600X on PBO. But you do have to take the time to tune the PBO settings. Um, out of the box, this chip was getting about 102 watts PPT for an all core process, which is going to be fairly normal for stock settings, but likely excessive because with the tuning, I was able to get this one down to around 90 watts, and that makes Cooling the CPU, a pretty ordinary task because uh, then you can get away with a simple tower cooler like the Hyper 212 Halo that I tested with. I did flash the BIOS to the latest stable version. In doing so, I used the flash BIOS button along with a USB thumb drive in the designated USB-A slot. The LED will flash a few times, then it'll start flashing faster to let you know it's writing. Fans and lighting will also power on at this point if you have that hooked up. Uh, the whole process just took about six minutes and was pretty uneventful. A couple things to watch out for. First off, it has a chipset fan and thankfully you can control this one because when I first started out with this board, the chipset fan made a very audible noise intermittently. And at first I was wondering, is that PSU fan cycling on and off? Um, but it wasn't that. It was a chipset fan. Because going into BIOS and checking the fan curves, you'll notice that the chipset fan's behavior is indexed of the CPU temp, which is a very odd choice because it's not like you have to use the CPU temp as a proxy for the chipset temps because the motherboard can monitor the chipset temps. So uh, as your CPU goes to 60 degrees or so, which is very common for Ryzen 7000 that you know is, is designated to run safely at 95 degrees, this fan is told to spin at 60% and maxes out uh, on the stock fan curve at 60%, 9,000 RPM. And that is a very audible point. As I was tuning this one, my impression was that you could already hear it above the case fans when it goes above 40% or 6,000 RPM. So 60% very audible. So first thing to do is switch the point of reference to the chipset temp and then manually set a curve that is a bit more reasonable when it comes to chipset thermal management. Now perfectly comfortable temps for a chipset 80, 85 degrees, those are okay. So one way to do it might just be to let the fan go up to the audible 40% level when it hits 80 degrees or 85 degrees, depending on what you're comfortable with. And then if you like, you can ramp up to where you want, you know, or, or to max it out past 100 degrees. Um, there's plenty of ways to do it, but you can manage it how you like because that's the whole point here. But for reference, you may not even get there. Uh, running the chipset fan at a quieter 4300 RPM for an extended gaming session with the tempered glass panel on the NR200P, it resulted in a max chipset temp of 58 degrees, which, you know, totally fine, and you won't hear the chipset fan. Without changing the index to the chipset temp, the fan would have been spinning at 9000 RPM due to the CPU temp being over 60 degrees, and the only game there would have been noise. All right, so the other thing is you might have heard of long post times with Ryzen 7000, like with the ASUS X670E ITX review. This one doesn't take nearly as long, and I clocked this board in at 23 seconds until seeing the MSI Dragon and the uh, boot up settings. And memory context restore being on auto versus enabled did not change that. So 
that looks to be working as intended on auto, uh, but that's ballpark of what you can expect. It is what it is. Sadly, 20 ish seconds is going to be average for Ryzen 7000 post times. Um, if you are seeing longer post times than that, then the memory context restore setting may be helpful to look into. It is under the OC menu. So I didn't have any issues with the XMP settings with the uh, Kingston RAM kit that I tested. I was also able to OC the 4800 megahertz kit tested to 5600 megahertz as well. Pretty seamless. All right, so likes. This is a good board with solid performance. It pairs very well with a mid-range uh, gaming build. So if you want to run a 7600, 7600X, 7700, 7700X, something like that. This would be well matched. The height and the size of the board's heat sinks are unobtrusive. It doesn't rely on any add-on cards or external audio devices. And that makes this much more mini ITX or SFF friendly compared to many boards on the market. And the build quality, it's fairly decent. Um, you've got the built-in rear IO shield, which is a nice touch for a board at this level. You've got that clear CMOS button on the back, even though it's a little bit proud. You know, like I said, not not terrible. Uh, very helpful when dialing in a RAM OC, so I love that uh, feature. Things I'm not too keen on, well, they're all layout related. The board is typical MSI ITX, which means there's some odd choices. Uh, you've got the CP fan and the pump fan header on the top right, fine. Uh, but then you have the sys fan header on the bottom right next to the RAM. The front panel connectors in a very terrible location on the bottom left which uh, that's going to make a very long run into a very tight space. Uh, keeping in mind, you already have the front panel audio cable. You've got an RGB cable there. The, that header is super, super close to the graphics card. Um, those all might be going there, and the graphics card sitting in the expansion slot is going to make that area super tight. But that's it. The main question here is to ask yourself if the I.O. from the B650 chipset is sufficient for you, which I think it will be for most users, but only you know your use case. And also if you are okay without PCIe 5 support for uh, both a graphics card and M.2, which you know, given how early it is in the life cycle for Gen 5, I think it's gonna be an acceptable compromise for most users. I mean, your Gen 5 cards, they'll be perfectly uh, compatible with PCIe 4. And right now, Gen 5 M.2s, they cost more than this board, right? But speaking of price, I am a bit confused about this one since earlier this year, it was 220, 230 US, quite reasonable. And now when I looked, it's at least 290, which kind of takes the shine off this board. In this neighborhood, you also have the Gigabyte B650i, which is now interestingly cheaper than this board. And that one supports one Gen 5 M.2. So if you want the MSI board, I'd be harder to recommend it at the current pricing. And I hope that the price hike is just a temporary thing because at 220 to 230 US, this board is highly recommended as a Zen 4 Mini ITX board for the rest of us and you know should be excellent for a mid-range SFF gaming system. So if this review was helpful and informative, if so, please give a like, subscribe if you haven't already. Links are down below. Thanks for watching.